Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection, and welcome to you who are watching on a video version. We invite you to share your comments below in the live chat and help us as we join together as a live audience in combining in understanding and in creating conversation about this episode. And if you are listening on an audio version through one of our audio podcast players through Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartMedia, or one of the other podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also leave us a rating. By doing those two things, it helps us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community as we are able to send this message out to more people and more listeners uh, throughout the blogosphere, throughout the radio waves, throughout the interwebs. So thank you for those who are watching on the video version and those who are participating on the audio version of the podcast. I will always say, um, if you are subscribed to the audio side through one of the audio podcast players, you will get this episode a little bit sooner than the video version. So just a little perk if you uh, do catch these podcasts as a audio podcast form. So with that aside, I want to welcome again everybody to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. It, this is an, an episode that I'm super excited about um, uh, presenting into uh, the Latter Gay Stories Square. It's an, it's an interview that I've wanted to do for a very long time. I think uh, Lori Lee Hall has a fascinating story. And so with that, I want to welcome to the podcast, Lori Lee Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Really glad to be here. I'm excited to be able to have you on the, the podcast because I've, I've followed your story. Um, I've had you on uh, the podcast for various things with affirmation um, over the years, but now I have Lori Lee Hall in the studio and I can ask all the hard questions and all the things that I've always wanted to ask Lori Lee Hall. Who boy. <laughs> okay, I'm ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So no, really no hardballs at all. But um, our story really began years ago. I was able to meet you. We've often joked around the kitchen table at Paul and Susie Augenstein's house. And we both were making this journey respectively about the same time. And mm -hmm. our worlds were kind of unfolding at the same time. And and we were stitching our pieces back together and trying to find what our new normal was. And now, all these years later, we're able to sit down together and show and, and discuss from where we came and the future that we look forward to. So I'm excited to be able to, to learn more about you and also to let the audience get to know Lori Lee Hall the way I get to see and interact and know you. So. I guess we start with... Um, if, if I could add, Kyle. Sure. Um, I, I don't know if I'm on screen or not sometimes. I'm just going to start talking. But um, when you shared your story with me, um, I was enthralled. I was touched deeply by your interest as you progressed in your journey for maintaining um, your relationship with your children and having a, an amicable relationship with your former spouse, their mom, um, that was what I was aspiring to as well. And you were such a great model of that. It really touched me. So thank you. Thank you. And that is possible for, for so many of us. That relationship is possible. And it has paid dividends for all of us today. Uh, just as a side note, we will get to your interview at some point. <laughs> I just recently was married and at that wedding, my ex-wife was there. And in that coming out experience, I've often talked about coming out and the difficult part of that journey, but also the, the beauty. And really, if I could sum up my whole coming out experience and my divorce and that separation with my wife, I've, of, I've often said that if ever I felt unconditional love, it was through that process and with my wife. But Really, I saw hundreds of people that were gathered at my wedding, at Jay and I's wedding, many that we didn't know who had just come into this space because of my advocacy and the podcast and what I was able to, a message of hope that I, I was able to bring. And I looked around and I, I really saw all those people gathered in that location, in that venue, and thanked my ex-wife because she was the one who was able to have the strength to let me go. And she was the one that allowed all of us to gather together. So for me, that was pretty special. That's the way it should be. Yeah. 
Beautiful. So thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. So Lori Lee Hall is a person that for lots of Latter-day Saints, um, they may not realize how influential you are and were to Mormonism. You were the designer, uh, architect of so many of Mormonism's most iconic spaces, chapels, uh, temples, the missionary training center, uh, the, the brain and the vision behind what Mormonism uses to celebrate their religion and to practice uh, and perform their covenant. Your story includes the painful and transformative journey of coming out. And if we want to talk about temples, I can only think of the temple video in your true self, mm -hmm. uh, who Lori Lee Hall really was behind that transformative step. So we want to talk about that today. I want to talk a lot about um, that journey for other transgender members of the church um, in or out adjacent to or within Mormonism who may find solace and direction in your story. You also have an upcoming memoir that I'm super excited about. That's true through signature book that um, I want um, to borrow temple words again, all to receive. <laughs> I, I want the world to be able to hear the story of Lori Lee Hall. So uh, where do we start? Where does your story begin? <sighs> wow. Um, it, it's, it's actually in the process of writing my memoir. I actually have my story pretty well organized in my mind now in ways that maybe it never has before. But I have to admit that my story begins, you know, as a five-year-old beginning to recognize gender conflict. And um, it's been very interesting to me to go back and try to write what I knew and understood and seemed to be feeling as a five-year-old um, when I was told I wasn't like my sisters or my mom, but I was different. And that was my first recognition that as they were telling me that I needed to act and be like a boy, that didn't fit. That didn't fit who I saw myself to be. But I also found that expressing myself as the way I felt I was, which felt quite innocent to do, um, was somewhere between not comfortable and dangerous as a child. Um, I learned by the time I was a teen to... Uh, hide pretty well in plain view and uh, to find opportunities to experience my gender um, in very private spaces and then when uh, the time came and this was when i was 18 i was headed to college and and it was 1979 and i knew nothing about transsexuals or tra the word transgender was not even spoken at that time there were no um there was no information there were there wasn't any guideline as to how to move forward there was no pathway forward for an individual like myself and i truly believed in some ways i might have been the only only one that thought and felt as i did um, so i buried very deeply my gender identity and all of that thinking about being a girl, um, and swearing I would never let it loose again. Um, and I headed off to the university to study architecture and in doing so also found the Mormon church. And I thought, here's a great institution who's going to help me to become a successful husband, father, priesthood holder with authority and um, just the pathway forward for me to replace all of those things I grew up with that I struggled with that I really wanted to be and show but couldn't and the church seemed like the perfect solution for me but in saying that I also had spiritual experiences in relationship with the church and my testimony and conversion which led me to deep diving, if you will, on in my, uh, in my service to the church and uh, 
maybe I'll pause for a moment and let Kyle adjust the story or ask any follow-up questions before I keep going. One, where you met the missionaries or how you came in contact with the church. And two, was that inside or outside of Utah? So I went to a university. Um, I, of course, background-wise, I grew up in central Massachusetts in New England, and I went west to go to the university all the way to Troy, New York. And uh, so I got my uh, architectural training at Rensselaer Polytechnic in upstate New York. And it was there that I had a classmate who um, was a Latter-day Saint. Uh, she uh, had grown up in, in uh, upstate New York as well, and we were classmates. And she was the type of person, a good young woman in the church who shared the gospel every chance she got. And of all of our friends, I was the one who started listening. And I found in uh, the things that she was sharing answers to my own spiritual questions and particularly this pattern of you know, eternal family and about the value of, of good family relationships and so forth that I felt were lacking in my own upbringing. And, uh, and all of it just seemed to click and particularly when she gifted me a Book of Mormon and I wound up quarantined in the uh, Rensselaer infirmary with uh, mononucleosis and, and didn't have anything else to do. I cracked open that Book of Mormon, started reading and felt very impressed that this was something I needed to pursue. And uh, we sought out the missionaries. I said, hey, if you guys got some time, I'd love to hear what you guys have to offer. And uh, it turns out I had sister missionaries that came and taught me the gospel. And I, I thought that was great, too, because it felt right to me. Um, I was that golden convert who had already had a testimony. The sisters asked me if I had prayed about the Book of Mormon, and I lied and said, no. <laughs> I said, yes, I had prayed about it. I actually hadn't prayed about it because I already had my conviction that it was of God and that there was something divine here that I needed to pursue. And so I launched off and did all of the things that um, that I should have done. I received the priesthood. I got an impression that President Kimball was right and every young man should serve a mission and that must include me and got myself ready for a mission and went and served. And um, I was fortunate that uh, because I joined the church at age 18, I didn't leave on my mission until I was 21. And in those days for a very short period of time, all missions were 18 months long. So I can now look back and say, I served an 18 month mission as a 20 year, one year old, which sounds like I served sister mission. <laughs> Amazing. Where did you uh, serve? Your I was, at? I was assigned uh, to serve in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And um, it was just a joyful, remarkable experience for me, hard as ever at first. And, um, with persistence, I conquered the, the language sufficiently to get by. And I just rejoiced in the chance to be able to share the things that had come into my life that was so meaningful. Um, I had to walk away from my education at, year, at the end of year three um, and forego my scholarships for the time for the two years after I got back in order to be able to serve. And uh, I, I wouldn't have done anything else but that at that time. As, as I'm listening to your story and kind of comparing it with many others that I've listened to, um, sometimes we use outside influences to bottle or hide or extinguish um, some real issues or the real view of what's going on in our world. Mm -hmm. Did you see the church uh, serving a mission, joining the church, serving a mission, obtaining the priesthood, doing all of the things that male members of the church were required to do as a way to lock away and hide that intricate part of you that was hidden deep down inside that you continued to shove. Um, is that familiar? You're shaking your head. So yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's interesting because there, especially as I'm writing my, my memoir now, there are things that you you do in experience that you don't realize until later 
that's what was going on. And I think if you had asked me at 21, as I was preparing for my mission, what's the, what's the impact of this in relationship to your gender identity that's buried, which of course no one knew about. I had never told a soul um, about that uh, for fear of fear. <laughs> and would I have been able to say, yeah, that's, this is helping me to keep that buried. Um, I wouldn't obviously have been able to say that at that time, but looking backwards now with an eye of understanding as to how that time frame fit into my, my overall story, absolutely, I was gung-ho to learn and do all of those male things as, as a way of finding what society, the world, my family, what the church then also told me I should be because of my assignment at birth. And without a question, I was, I was after all of those things with a passion. I'm curious about if you remember uh, or recall any of the church's teachings. Um, you say President Kimball was the prophet as you were mm -hmm. um, being baptized in the church. Uh, quick on President Kimball's heels were a boy K. Packer, who specifically talked about gender um, in a few of his conference talks, specifically that if those who believe that they are trapped, their spirit is trapped in the wrong body, they, that is something of the devil. Mm -hmm. were it, do you recall any, any of those uh, church messages through general conference, through um, publications like the Miracle of Forgiveness and, and other, like in the enzyme that reflected? In, and then if so, then how, how, do you, how do you approach those topics and still move forward within, within Mormonism? Yeah, the, the, the teaching of that time um, that's, you know, that kind of struck me and stuck with me um, was President Kimball's comment that those who um, seek to change gender, I'm not quoting but paraphrasing, um, will one day have to explain it to their maker. And, you know, that was, that carried me through three decades of my adult life until I finally, and I'll tell this story later if you get to get me to get to it, um, once I knew that my maker knew exactly who I was. <laughs> and so no explanation required. <laughs> I think that's going to be a perfect way to end the podcast. Is we'll, <laughs> we'll end with that. So as you're navigating this, um, the, the great Mormon message really is um, family and children and um, patriarchal order. Mm -hmm. So you would have to begin dating and begin that process of building a family. How does that work? So I, uh, I spent a lot of time with this gal that introduced me to the church at the beginning, um, but I was never a dater. Um, I was really kind of attracted to guys in high school. Um, my, my closest friends during high school were were boys and uh, and I had age dependent um, or age appropriate um, attraction to those guys and one of them knows that now and is grateful that I didn't ever tell him that um, but clearly once I got into the church part of accepting this role going forward meant that I had to um, include affection, attention, attraction for women, which seemed to be not that different. I mean, not that, I, I wasn't, I, you know, I, guess, I don't know how to say it. I guess I, I wasn't not attracted to girls. Growing up, I was attracted to the beauty of, of women because it was what I wanted for myself. And so knowing that I needed to ultimately successfully find someone to marry, um, even though I was not a dater, <laughs> um, socially kind of awkward in those days, maybe still, um, somehow attraction to, uh, to certain women um, became possible for me. And I, I guess I look back now 
I look back now at my sexuality and I'm somewhere in a, in a pansexual or demisexual kind of uh, space where I feel particularly that I develop a deep emotional relationship with someone that I grow close to by getting to know them really well first. And that, and it much, really in many ways, it's not a sexual attraction. It's a, it's an emotional and intellectual attraction and, and a level of intimacy that doesn't necessarily require conventional sexual intimacy. Um, and from that perspective, I, I was able to navigate that world um, successfully We're in <laughs> enough. Really important territory here. And, and I want to highlight a few things that um, a lot of our audience members might appreciate. And, and I want to do this genuinely and naively at the same time. Um, there is a difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. And that is often, as people move into this space and try to better understand the LGBTQ experience, there is a difference between LGB and T. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that for a second. But I also, um, I think this is curiously fascinating to me. Um, you're, you're, you knew you had some form of gender inconsistency. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you also are dating and realizing that you're more attracted to men. Um, initially. Initially, mm -hmm. yeah. um, than women. I, I think this is just fascinating uh, territory to me to just to see how, um, I, I don't want to say this is evidence-based, but in the heart, where the heart was at, um, the heart knew where its love needed to be found. And I think that's fascinating. I wanted to say that as a side note, but I do want to talk about this difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. If you would just f briefly describe what the difference between that is for the audience. Sure. It's, um, it's often said that sexual orientation is who you're attracted to. Um, and gender identity is who you are. Um, who you identify yourself to be. And one of the best ways I've heard it explained is if you imagine algebra class from when you were a ninth grader and there's an x-axis that runs horizontally and that has to do with orientation. On the far left is extreme heterosexuality as defined by society on the extreme right would be extreme homosexuality. And opposite that, perpendicular to that, is the vertical y-axis, which may be at the very top um, extreme cisgender identity, um, the man's man, the very feminine female. At the bottom of the vertical axis might be the extremely gender conflicted person who uh, assignment at birth and their identity are so incredibly mismatched that extreme pain is the result. And somewhere in the middle would be the spectrum in both directions. Um, and everybody lands somewhere on that graph. Um, my sexuality may be somewhere in the middle of that graph, not being either extreme. My gender identity was to the extreme conflict. So I'm kind of x-axis zero and y-axis infinity, <laughs> negative infinity in that case, um, if that makes sense. Um, they're two separate things. And I also like to, at least for my own self, I... I found it hard to explain to people my sexual orientation without first explaining to them my gender identity, particularly before I transitioned. Um, as a high schooler, being attracted to boys made perfect sense to me because I knew I was female. So I was straight, <laughs> but without the terminology, also trans. Um, when I 
in high school had a, a girlfriend who wasn't a girlfriend, but a girl who was a friend who befriended me because we were in mechanical drawing classes together and we were in math classes together and we had common interests and, and so forth. Um, to me, that was a great female to female friendship, which I had never had before in my young life. And when we were alone once and she made a move on me sexually, I freaked out and it freaked her out. And that was kind of the end of our friendship together because she was expecting something that was, she was clearly having developing feelings for that. I just saw her as, as my good friend and just, I couldn't go there in my mind that somehow I needed to be attracted to her at that time. Then the church changes that because the nature of, you know, you need to find a spouse who you can make a family with and so forth. And so I don't think the church changed my orientation, but allowed me to, or caused me to, um, focus it on that same path that I was trying to focus all my rest of my life on, which included boxing up everything about who I really was. We've often talked about in this space that being gay or trans, um, somewhere along that spectrum that you talked about, is just an ingredient into this whole um, mix of who we are. It's not all-inclusive. It's not my only identity. It's a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I can I fully understand what you're describing here because I'm, I'm recognizing that in my own life as well. I knew that I was gay, but I also didn't wake up every morning um, trying to figure out how to fix, change. There were other things that I aspired to and wanted to as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, I knew I was gay and I wanted to be as happy as possible and, and make my world as easy as possible. And I also wanted to love and be loved and all of the, the things that come with that. But I, I've, I'm fully understanding and recognizing as you're describing what your experience was like in my own experience, knowing that um, we often, maybe in our quietest moments, do our very best to try to undo or change or fix what we think is wrong with us. Um, but also, as we discussed earlier, find undue influences or those outside influences um, that may contribute to us changing and, and becoming more congruent with who and what we feel we are. Trying to adapt to the world around us in a way that's safe and productive, which for most people probably means becoming their best self because that's where the world's trying to take them. In my case and, and in the case of many of our friends, um, burying their best self and trying to adapt to a false version of self and try to make that work for months, years, decades, as I did, um, it winds up being the struggle of a lifetime to try to live a fallacy when at the same time attempting to say, I, I have integrity in all other aspects of my life, but my truth. <laughs> let's, let's talk about that truth. Let's talk about um, marriage and the rearing of children. Yeah. I think this is an interesting subject that we don't hear often uh, from the transgender point of view. Um, what it is, what, uh, let's first talk a little bit about the marriage. Mm -hmm. um, what was life like early on in, in the wedding and the marriage and how did that marriage um, work knowing that there was still a secret buried? Yeah, and the, um, the, the fact that there was a secret buried wasn't a thought that I had as I got off my mission and at age 24 found a young lady who thought I was, you know, pretty special. And, uh, and we were friends. You know, we, we started out as friends. Um, again, I still wasn't interested in, in initiating any level of intimate relationship. Um, as a return missionary, I figured it, I was going to do everything right in the best way possible. So, but it also wasn't in my mind or my heart to go rushing into a relationship. I just knew that my mission president told me that that had to happen. And although I kind of resisted for a while, um, 
the whole ward thought we should be married. Uh, they could see we were, you know, good for each other. And uh, the fact that our last names were both Hall and we appeared together on the ward roster, although in different family groups, <laughs> made, made it really easy for people to say, yeah, you guys belong together. Um, and so eventually knowing I needed to do the right thing and, and having a genuine love and interest in, in her, we, uh, we decided to marry. Um, was I carrying a secret at that time? Not consciously. Because I had so well convinced myself that in the intervening six years between the time I had successfully as a high school graduate buried my identity and now as a senior in college with a mission behind me, that I was this priesthood male. I didn't enter the marriage with any kind of conscious idea that I was harboring a secret. Um, I had buried it, it was gone. Um, years later, skipping ahead, but I won't want to skip ahead and skip all the things you asked me to talk about, but years later, I did have to face that accusation that, yeah, I really did know that, but refused to accept it of myself to where I could have shared it with her and given her a fair chance to understand what she was getting into. Um, in the end, she didn't sign up for who I really was. But... Looking backwards, one of the things that I observed about our early days of marriage was that I didn't enjoy having male roommates in college, and I didn't enjoy having male companions on my mission. I was very modest and very uninterested in, uh, to the point of fear of letting my roommate or my companion see me dressing. Um, I was pretty awkward that way. I would shower in the middle of the night so that they wouldn't catch me outside out of my clothes. Um, I did a lot of things to try to be, and again, with the mindset that, yeah, I'm, I'm male and I'm doing this male thing, but in my heart of hearts, I really felt like I was a girl put into this awkward situation being a single girl, being a companion to these single guys and not wanting to reveal myself, you know, in the presence of a guy. Um, and at the same time, psychologically, mentally saying, I'm, I'm a guy. But my heart was saying, no, you're not. You're a girl. Protect yourself from these guys. <laughs> so I'm curious, as you are... Um describing what it's like to live with companions, live with men. Do you perceive this radical shift to now living with a woman? It, yes. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not certain that I recognized it at the time, but I started to feel the impact of it right away. Um, it had been six years since... Um, I'd had sisters and my mom and so forth that I lived with uh, growing up and suddenly I'm married and there's this woman right next to me and all of a sudden it wasn't easy to keep my feelings, my gender identity buried. Um, living with a woman brought all of that back to the surface and but now I knew I had to manage it. It had to stay tucked away. But there were times when I was horribly jealous of the life that she was living. Um, as we had children and she began to nurture and care for them, there were aspects of that that I just wanted for myself. And of course, in my role as husband and father, I could do as much of that as time and energy would permit, but there was something missing. And I especially experienced it 
one night when she was out and I was, I had three little ones at the time and our, the one who's now our middle child was the brand new baby at the time. And, uh, I'd gotten the other two to bed and I was holding this brand new baby close to me and just, I found this just, this is what I'm missing. I need to have this kind of connection to, uh, to these little children that somehow my role and responsibility and so forth didn't naturally afford me. Um, if I could have, I would have gladly nursed this little baby. It was that kind of deep and intimate thing that I was looking for that just wasn't available. Um, at times, as time went on, I would occasionally, uh, as I had done in my youth, I would occasionally borrow some of my wife's clothing and again start to explore that side of me and then beat myself up terribly because that's not what the eldest quorum president in the ward should be doing. Um, and so it was very difficult. And then about 10 years into our marriage, the proclamation on the family came out. And I was, by then I was um, the high priest group leader in the ward at a very young age. And studying that document with an honest desire to teach its principles to um, the high priests in our ward and the families in our ward, um, I became very engulfed with the binary separation of roles of men and women. And it started me on a downward spiral, a spiral um, where about five months after the proclamation was issued, I had, and I wasn't able to describe what it was at the time, but I had what I look back now and realized was a severe gender dysphoric experience in which I collapsed, literally collapsed on the floor of our living room in our empty house one day when I should have been heading off to work and just cried out sobbing in, uh, in an attitude of prayer that I cannot do mail anymore. And it was 15 years later after uh, I had buried my female identity that I cried out that I can't do this male thing. This breakdown that happens, do you know what brought it on? What was the impetus? I probably couldn't have said at the time other than those very words, I cannot do mail anymore. But as I look back, it was the accumulation of these feelings of being in this wrong life, of, of being in this situation where I was required to live this lie of my false presentation as male. Um, and then the church, um, that I loved and served puts out this document that so strongly clarifies the distinction between male roles and female roles. And the fact that my cry used that term, I cannot do male anymore, tells me I had the proclamation just, you know, deeply in my thoughts that wasn't me. And just that wasn't what I, what I was going to be able to do. And the result of that breakdown was I had to step away from my employment. Um, I, I essentially had a nervous breakdown in which I couldn't function for quite a number of weeks. And I really had to kind of start over again. Um, if I had lived, if that had occurred 15 years in the future, I might have had the ability to describe to my therapist at that time from LDS Family Services what on earth I was experiencing, but I didn't have the words at that time. I, I didn't know how to explain what was really going on. So all I could say was how I was kind of feeling in terms of, uh, of how it was affecting me at work and how it was affecting me at home, but not ever being able to come out and say it's because I'm really not male. 
I want to talk about these different avenues. We have the avenue of, of work, of because you're working for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At that time, I was working for, for a firm. I was part of an architectural practice in Albany, New York, um, when that happened. When the, when the breakdown happens? Yes. Okay. We're on the same page. Okay. I was, I was, and my brain was fast-forwarding back to, like, Provo City Center and Temple time. Right. Um, okay. So as the breakdown's happening, um, you are isolating yourself, essentially, from these outside influences. I'm curious what your relationship now is with your wife, where you now have become at odds with the proclamation and the maybe at odds isn't the best descriptor. You have now realized that there are some things that aren't measuring well or lining up the best with your personal experience and what you're seeing from the religious and faith side. How does that impact your family? How does that impact your relationship with your wife? So you've just leapt forward um, 20 years to, uh, and if that's where we want to take the conversation. Um, and I'm happy to go back 20 years too. <laughs> Definitely for sure. Because it, it, it is a leap, you know, to, uh, to get to when the brethren really challenged me to read and understand the proclamation. And I didn't get any further than the eternal nature of gender identity and how important that is. Um, and then my interpretation of that is, yeah, absolutely. I totally get that eternally in pre-mortal life, in this life and in the life to come, my eternal gender, gender identity, which is an essential characteristic of who I am, has been and always is now and always will be female. And... That was that didn't set well with the senior brethren that I was meeting with once they knew ten years ago that I considered myself transgender. Um, they were unwilling to accept my testimony with regard to that. Um, the rest of the document falls out the way that it does, as far as I'm concerned. It should never be weaponized, but as far as as meeting my needs as a doctrinal principle, eternal gender identity makes perfect sense to me. It's just that I have the right as an individual to self-determine and to express, proclaim, if you will, what that eternal gender identity is. It's not, in my case, my biological sex assigned at birth to suggest that a non-Latter-day Saint doctor could look between my legs as an infant and say, this is a female spirit, is ludicrous. He saw physical parts that he considered to be male and assigned male at birth. But through personal revelation and through my own lived experience, I know that my eternal gender identity has always been and will always be female. And it's immutable, unchangeable. And I tried for f better part of 40 years to live otherwise until my spirit said, enough. I will not, I, my soul, will not put up with this anymore. So I absolutely do not want to miss the 20 years. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super fascinated by how this evolution is happening. So where I, I was jumping, I was thinking that we were, we were forward all the way to Utah at this point, but we're not. No, in, in that leap ahead, we miss the fact that um, that breakdown took place in 1996. And once I began to recover emotionally and mentally and, you know, to some degree physically from that breakdown, 
I repeated what I had done as an 18 year old, not knowing my path forward to be true to myself. I recommitted to living the lie of being the best male that I could be for myself, for my young family, for the church. Um, and that ultimately led me to move our family to Utah and to begin working for the church in late 1996. Um, and then shortly thereafter to be uh, made a director in the church's physical facilities department, to be called as a bishop, and later to be called as a stake president around the time that I was asked to lead the design and construction of temples. And another 15 years went by from that earlier breakdown to when I finally said things have to change in my life. And then finally on that third iteration, about 11 years ago, I found enough information uh, mainly online uh, through resources that didn't exist the previous two times out where I could see that I was not alone thinking the way I, I did, feeling the way I did about myself, that even there were Latter-day Saints who understood that they had gender dysphoria and were transgender, terms I had never understood before, but recognized them in myself. And at the time of my personal self-acceptance 11 years ago, I was still a sitting stake president. I was the director of temple design for the church worldwide. I was reporting to the first presidency on a monthly basis, all of the design and construction of temples and uh, doing some other special projects for the church as well. And had that kind of top of the world experience professionally, ecclesiastically. Um, I had my kids were growing up and going to college and serving missions and um, everything about my Latter-day Saint life that I had set out to become and to be, I was on top of the world at that point, professionally, ecclesiastically, in my home and family and everything, my community, everything about my life was perfect and I was dying inside. And again, my spirit crying out, things have to change. And so again, without even really being willing to consciously say, this is the thing that needs to change, I began to explore what I didn't like about myself, what I didn't like about my life. And it brought me to an understanding that it was the gender identity being true to myself that was truly missing. And I reached a point where in my mind, logically, and in my heart, emotionally, I knew myself to be female and transgender, and I self-accepted that. But I hadn't reached the point yet where I knew if God was okay with that or not. And it happened to be while I was on a trip um, for the church uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, where we're going to do some historic research there for the Lisbon Temple, that I finally, presenting as Lori in my hotel room by myself, got on my knees and presented myself to my God and said, Heavenly Father, this is me. This is Lori. And I've studied this out, and I believe I'm transgender, and, and this is who I feel I really am. And as I had learned to do in prayer, I paused and listened, and never in an audible voice, but more in deep feelings in my mind and heart, I really got the impression that There was joy in heaven that I had finally reached a point where I knew myself as they already knew me to be, as my heavenly parents knew me to be, and, uh, and it was good, and it was okay. And a million times better than realizing that I wasn't alone in this or that I was 
it was okay to admit to myself that I was trans was the sense that God already knew and was happy that I finally caught up. Was happy that you finally knew also. Yes, and that I was willing to be okay with it. And that what family and doctors and society and culture in the world had told me to be because of a, of a not a mistake, but an assignment at birth was not who I needed to be to really fulfill the measure of my creation, the way I was created and the way that I existed as a daughter of God before coming to this earth. So that's what I mean when I say I'm comfortable with the fact that when I meet my maker, I can be embraced because I am exactly who my creator created me to be. What do you do with all that information? What do you do with truth when you humbly sit on your knees or kneel on your knees kneel, yeah. and have that uh, realization that I'm not alone, I'm not broken, and that my best days are ahead of me. Yeah, and I was I was filled with joy and I was filled with hope, um, but I still was confronted by the fact that what do I do with this information? I think that's the nature of your question. I had lived at that point um, about 50 years knowing that this truth wasn't palatable. And um, the first thing that went into my mind was I've got to share this with my wife. She needs to know. The secret was out in my mind. Um, and uh, so I, I did the best thing that I could figure out how to do. I wrote a letter and had it ready for that moment when I was going to share that with her because I knew I would be too emotional to explain it <laughs> and that she would be too emotional hearing it, that I wouldn't get the basic message out. Um, uh, and so that's why I wrote it down. And when that moment came a few weeks later, um, you know, I was able to let her read that and we sobbed together and started trying to figure out what this means going forward. And um, our marriage actually lasted another six years um, after I came out to her. And I moved very slowly through um, medical and social transition um, in large part to not go too fast for her, to try to maintain this new and adapting relationship that we had was there ever a point during that coming out experience in the subsequent weeks or months after that i often i see this as a sort of a honeymoon um period where all things are out on the table so now it seems to calm down there's not as much focus and attention was that part of your experience as well where you finally shared and she knew a little bit prior uh, you've had you had a, a few discussions over the years about this topic, but was there a relief that she knew much more about the topic now that you had? Um, I'm just curious if that if that relief came to you and that's what allowed things to simmer for a bit, as well as allowing her to navigate this journey as well. Really, Kyle, to set the record straight, um, my coming out to her caught her completely by surprise. Um, she lived with me and carried me through my breakdown in 1996, but also didn't know why um, that had I'd had that experience. I had not told anyone um, at that point. Um, so coming out to her was was completely new, and um, it brought me enormous relief to be able to share that truth and set me on a trajectory of, you know, being excited and hopeful for the future. And yet when each step took place of my inching forward towards my true self, 
um, it literally caused her greater angst. So if there was a honeymoon period, it wasn't a shared honeymoon. I was feeling better and she was feeling worse. And we, we used to agree to, and said to each other that my happiness caused her pain. And if I was to make her happy, it was going to cause me pain. And that was one of the, the serious things we had to reckon with is how to balance how much, how much reality and happiness and truth could I enjoy versus how much it was going to cause her pain and difficulty. How much would she have to bear or the other way around, if I waited and held back and, you know, stopped and didn't present a certain way at certain times and, you know, and the struggle that came with that so that she had peace. It was a kind of that constant back and forth. But she would recognize, as I did, that it got incrementally harder for me to throttle it back at all and there were advances in my progression towards full transition that I couldn't couldn't not make any longer where in that six-year period um, did your kids find out early on we brought we brought our kids in who were you know all married at that point the older ones um, we had a little girl at home still, but uh, the uh, four older ones all had significant others. Um, and uh, we brought them in as couples, each on their own, and explained together that this was the case and tried to express security in our family and so forth and stability. Um, so we we tried to at least let them know that this was what was real about our circumstances um it landed differently for each of them based on where they were in their lives and their their experiences but um we started as well sharing it with friends and and other family members close friends and family members and again this was happening about 10 years ago at this time um and it was it was that fall that the senior brethren found out that they had a sitting stake president out in Tooele Valley who considered themselves to be transgender. Do you know how the apostles found out that that was the case? I do. Um, one of my sons struggled with the information that I had shared, that we had shared, when I came out and approached his bishop for support in his home ward, and the the telephone game began, and every time his bishop called the stake president, his stake president called the uh, area seventy, and the area seventy spoke to the uh, area president over Utah at that time, who was Elder Clayton. Um, the, the story got magnified, and I was some twisted evil monster <laughs> by the time they brought me in for interviews um, to find out what on earth was I doing and how, how could I have possibly become so twisted and still be serving my steak. I had to talk them down off the wall for, you know, this, to help them understand this is now this isn't near as bad as you thought it was, but there's elements of truth to this. And yes, I do consider myself to be transgender. Did you meet with um, apostles or did you meet with uh, area authorities? Um, I met with Elder Clayton because I was a stake president and he had um, ecclesiastical responsibility for, for Utah at the time. Um, with regard to my um, calling as a stake president, I also met with the presiding bishop at the time who... Um, was our now Apostle Elder Stevenson was the presiding bishop at the time in relationship to my employment, you know, being a, a church employee under the bishopric's direction in church physical facilities. Um, you know, both men were as gracious as they knew how they could be. 
um, and both had a responsibility to go to the Quorum of the Twelve in the First Presidency to decide my fate, if you will. Um, taking the story down to, uh, to uh, its quick end um, in the temple meeting, um, under the direction of, or in, in the voice of President Packer at the time and, and Elder Clayton, they made a recommendation regarding my calling as stake president, the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve approved that I be um, honorably released as a stake president who had served eight and a half years at that point with no further mention or action taken at that time, which, you know, took place and was, you know, lovely. <laughs> Quite frankly, I was glad it didn't turn into anything more at that time. The presiding bishopric then met with the first presidency on the very next day and um, met regarding my employment. And keep in mind that at that time, uh, I worked very closely with the presiding bishopric's office and I met with the first presidency on a monthly basis talking about temples, presenting temples to them. So they knew me very well. I wasn't a faceless employee um, that they were talking about being transgender uh, or considering myself to be transgender. Um, their decision was so long as I otherwise was temple worthy that they liked my work and it complimented my work very much and they wanted me to remain an employee. So out of that, I remained an employee on probation, if you will. Um, but I was also released as stake president, which was a sense of relief for me because it was getting very difficult to serve in that position um, as I was coming to myself. Um, and I served another four years as a church employee. And just for chronology's sake, this was uh, President uh, Monson's? Monson, mm -hmm. 2012. Um, I was a little nervous as to how I would be treated when I went to my next presentation to the first presidency after I knew that they had twice um, had to deal with the fact that I was who I was. Um, and uh, I'll tell this personal experience uh, that um, made a difference for me. Uh, I went to the meeting early, as I always did, and was in the, you know, the main conference room in the church administration building on the first floor and took my normal place kind of opposite the door in the middle of the table. The first presidency would sit on the right. And shortly after I arrived and got settled, President Uchtdorf entered the room and he would normally go to his left around the top of the table and take his place uh, at the head of the table in the second counselor's seat. This time when he came in, he looked at me, smiled, went to his right and around the table the opposite way so that he could greet me personally, which quite frankly wasn't ever the case. Um, he put his arm around me, drew me close to him so we were you know, very tight together, put his hand on my other arm and uh, gave me a squeeze and said in his big deep voice, and his lovely accent, Via, so grateful that you are here with us. <laughs> and I just melted to feel his love, recognizing that he knew what I knew <laughs> about myself and uh, that I was, I was wanted and needed there. Um, and so I continued to serve that way as long as I was allowed to. What projects were you currently working on for the church at that time? Um, particularly in that season would have been um, a myriad of, of temples, but particularly the Provo City Center Temple uh, had just, that, that year had just gone through its design processes. Um, groundbreaking had been, had taken place that summer. And uh, I may have in that presentation may have even been presenting the interiors for design approval of the Provo City Center Temple. Um, if it wasn't that month, it was one of the two months either side of it. So that's what was going on in those days. And at the same time or thereafter was the Provo MTC. Right. The Missionary Training Center. About a year later, um, 
forces as they were decided that having me too close to the first presidency wasn't a good idea. So I was excused from working on temples and reassigned to working on what was referred to as the church's special physical facilities projects, which included the upcoming expansion of the missionary training center. Being put off temples in the way it was done without any explanation, and yet my knowing that it was related to the fact that I was trans uh, hurt me deeply, and I considered whether I could continue to work for the church. Fortunately, I made the right choice and settled myself down and dug in to this new project, to this missionary training center, because it ultimately became one of the most enjoyable projects I ever worked on with a beautiful spirit about it and gave me great opportunities to do some things which were, you know, just, again, top of my career kind of experiences. But as I look back at that point, I was also starting hormones. I was, you know, progressing in my transition and in many ways, Lori Lee was the director of Temple, I mean, of, of special projects that built, designed and built the MTC more than any of my other projects because I had really come into my own, even though I still wore the white shirt and tie during the day at work. Um, and so that was a very positive and special experience for me. I thought about that and I've, we've been able to talk about this experience on multiple occasions and I've heard you speak on multiple occasions and in reference to the Provo city center temple in terms of metaphor yes, and your story, I um, couldn't find a more fitting metaphor. We had, we have a building that literally burned leaving just its ex exterior shell and you were able to come in and lift that building higher to heaven than it was before and in a very real sense maintained its exterior shell but everything on the inside everything that supported it was reinforced and beautified and allowed its natural beauty to shine through and then it become a blessing to everyone else around it and i thought what a fitting metaphor for someone who was going through this transformation herself Mm -hmm. it's it's one of these things that i refer to is the truth is more exquisitely beautiful than fiction um, if you were to write this story you couldn't write the transformation of that building and the transformation of myself to occur more concurrently um, with uh, with each other and again while it was happening i wasn't cognizant of it once it had occurred, I looked back and realized that within, within a month of the fire that I'd been hospitalized and came to the conclusion that I needed to change my life, within a month of the announcement of the Provo City Center Temple was that experience I had in Lisbon in prayer within a month or so of the groundbreaking i started coming out to family and friends um, it, it was just sequentially concurrent all the way through that process to where a few months well within a month after the dedication of the temple i came out at work um, which i'd been told not to do and just a few months later um, I asked a very specific question uh, to those at work with regard to my ability to transition and remain an employee, which ultimately ended my career with the church. So that time frame of tra transforming um, the tabernacle into the temple and all of the symbology that you express so well, um, including the fact that we didn't actually raise the building up, but we held it in the air while we dug a big hole underneath of it, reminded me that at the same time, I had engaged a therapist who was literally holding me up while I was getting sorted out and strengthened and reinforced until 
we could build together a foundation under me that would support me going forward in my journey. The metaphor is just, it's so beautiful in how it perfectly relates to my journey and the journey of that building at the same time. It's, uh, it's, it's so much deeper and more remarkable than I've been able to just explain. Um, and it's, it wouldn't be possible to write that. It just, it happened that way. The beauty is that it was personal and that I would assume that building has a part of Lori and Lori has a part of that building forever and ever. Well, something I'll explain and you're absolutely right, but something I'll explain in my memoir not wanting to reveal too much about what's in there is that the day that the brethren called me, the office of the bishopric called me to inform me that the first presidency wanted us to consider using the shell of the tabernacle to be a temple. I was actually at home by myself practicing presenting as Lori. I took the call from the bishopric's office in full presentation hair and makeup and clothing is Lori. And while I really wasn't certain whether I was sinning at the time by doing that, because I hadn't reached that point where I knew where God stood regarding me, I was so excited about the assignment that I pulled out some drawing paper and started laying out the temple inside the tabernacle. And by the time I was done in a little while later, might have taken an hour or so, I had the layout of the temple clearly sketched out on paper, and I was still presenting as Lori. And looking backwards, that experience of having the flow of the Spirit and the inspiration that I was so accustomed to enjoying in designing each new project, have that coming to me still while I was presenting as I was, actually helped erase an enormous amount of guilt and shame I felt with regard to whether I was okay or not, or whether I was sinning or not, by considering presenting myself as my authentic self. All of that kind of swept away by the fact that I could still perform this important function that I felt in many ways not just employed to do, but called to do because it was so intimate with the spirit but that happened to lori not just that previous guy i think it's so beautiful so so many so many metaphors and and connections in this story but you do you do indicate that the church said no this isn't sustainable and they terminated your employment how did that happen yeah i I, I saw the fact that it was coming when the Great Utah Compromise uh, came out in, uh, and was, became uh, law in Utah in March of 2015, um, protecting the employment rights of including transgender employees to, to specifically transition on the job socially and legally and, and so forth medically. Um, without any threat of loss of employment, but that the church in helping move that law forward, which was the compromise part of the Utah Compromise, um, built their own uh, loophole, which allowed, to put it in frank terms, allowed the church to continue to discriminate against its transgender employees. And so I had convinced myself this was... <laughs> at the beginning of 2016, a little while after the law had come out, that I would remain employed at church headquarters if I could. And before I left the building for the last time, I would, I will have, I would have asked the question specifically, is the church willing in my case to extend the same privilege to me as a transgender employee that was required now by law of all other employers to extend to their employees. And so the day came when, and 
keep in mind that this point I was literally out and transitioned and fully living as Lori everywhere but at work. And I couldn't continue to swap genders every day, you know, be female in the morning, be male during the day, be female again when I got home. That changing back and forth was becoming impossible emotionally to continue to do. I reached that point where I couldn't not do it any longer. And I approached my managing director and human resource director, and we sat down together and I asked the question um, that I'd been planning to ask. It's morally and ethically and medically and emotionally correct for an employer to extend this basic accommodation to an employee, a transgender employee, to allow transition to occur and safeguard employment. And I said, that's all I ask for. Um, allow that to occur, and I promise you I will be not only as great an employee as I've already been, but even better because I won't be struggling any longer. I'll be able to give you my full measure of devotion <laughs> as an employee because I won't be hiding my real self any longer. I won't be living this falsehood that hurts my spirit so much. And uh, I received a commitment that I would get the answer, not just an opinion, but the actual answer um, as to whether the church human resource committee would allow that to occur. And then unfortunately, the following week, my temple recommend was removed disqualifying me from ever being a church employee again. And I moved quickly as I'd already planned to do to retire instead of being terminated. I never got the answer to my question other than I really did kind of get the answer to the question. It wasn't going to be possible at that time and it's probably still not possible today. Um, I was prepared to lose my employment and I was grateful that it worked out that I was able to retire but I was disappointed because I truly thought that if anyone was in a position to ask that question and to perhaps sway hearts enough to get the right answer that it could have been in my case and paving the way for other transgender employees that were closeted at the time that I knew personally that worked for, for the church. I hoped against hope that I could change things so that they could live authentically and contribute as well. But that wasn't to be. They still remain in the lurch. And I think in cases of all the ones I'm thinking of, they're no longer church employees now either, but have transitioned and are living their full authentic lives, but without the opportunity to contribute to an organization that lost the opportunity to have their skills. I, I, and that's exactly what I was thinking. Not only do we see a loss of skill, but in terms of Mormonism, where we um, have always professed to have a chorus of a, of of varying voices yeah the more and more the church pushes against the lgbtq community against people of color against other marginalized communities the more we see a chorus of b flats only right it's yeah it's terribly unfortunate um I think I still had my best years in me at that point. Um, I think that uh, particularly in the creative areas of the church and in church employment that the LGBTQ community has enormous opportunities to contribute great. And, and yet it's so difficult to contribute in an environment that doesn't accept you that's not built for you um, and to try to conform for a season so that that can occur is is just so 
damaging and harmful to an individual. Uh, I stayed in church employment 20 years after that original breakdown back in 96, finally retiring in 2016. Those 20 years were thrilling for me, but also became extremely harmful and challenging to continue to be able to do. But I was just naive enough to think that maybe things could change. You know, we were, for a season, we were, rode the wave of marriage equality and even the Utah Compromise, as flawed as it was. But then all of a sudden, the policy of exclusion occurred. And following right behind that were the experiences I just described of not being able to receive the accommodation I needed. And suddenly it seemed like any hope for a better world in that time frame for LGBTQ folks within the church, within church employment, within service in the church, even membership in the church just seemed to be dark again. And I don't think there's any escaping the reality that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a infiltration, uh, a contingent of LGBTQ uh, employees. Sure. You clearly weren't the only one. We both know uh, many, many in church employees who are impacted by this topic and who are navigating this journey uh, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And by isolating employees one by one with retirement or a loss of opportunity doesn't solve the reality for them that LGBTQ people are influencing the church and are participating in its very highest functions. And I think that's a reality that's beautiful. Yeah. And that I see the contributions by LGBTQ people as being a, a grand benefit to um, this community and to the church. But I do want to move forward a little bit. I want to talk about the, um, the Lori Lee Hall in full beauty and honor and <laughs> now that you're on the other side of the aisle can we say right um, what is life like what so the it's important that we get to this chapter of the interview because um i've just shared the pain and the trauma which were you know my immediate reality for example when i interviewed for mormon stories five years ago but we're really now all about celebrating queer joy. And, um, you know, at this point in my life, five years removed from, from um, being put out of the employment and then being excommunicated on top of that, um, I can now say that with time, with healing, with time to um, really reflect on all of these things and to move forward into new spaces where... Yes, I lost connections with some family members. Yes, I lost a ton of friends and acquaintances who I thought were my friends. And, uh, and yes, I lost a significant uh, part of my employment, my professional life. I've been able to gain all of those back in new ways and then some. Um, I have friends and connections and a network of people that I love and who love me that far exceeds whatever I might have had before. Um, I found uh, someone who is now the love of my life, uh, who I enjoy life living together with, who has brought to me um, adding to my five kids and 13 grandchildren has brought, brought in her four kids and, and her eight or nine grandchildren as well. And, it, you know, and it's just... It, it feels a little bit like the legend of Job, you know, who had all of these things taken away and then got them back um, tenfold or a hundredfold. Um, I've been able to uh, enjoy having my practice, my personal practice of architecture and find joy in being able to practice my craft as my authentic self. As much as a thrill of it was to to be presenting as Lori when I sketched out the Provo City Center Temple, how much more enjoyable it is to stand in front of my county government and present to them uh, 
the design of a new courthouse, which I've had the opportunity to do and have them appreciate and recognize my capacity as an architect and not be distracted in the least fact by the fact that I'm a woman with transgender experience. Um, how thrilling is that? Um, how wonderful it's been to be able to serve affirmation as a board member and a member of the executive committee these past five years and travel different parts of the world, both in person and virtually, and meet the members of affirmation all over the world and, and realize how much love and capacity we have to serve and bless and heal and even save lives. Um, so all of that, Kyle, represents um, a quick summary of, of queer joy and how it's multiplied way beyond what I felt initially that I was giving up and lost, um, that I've gained back and then some. I'm grateful for the relationships I've retained that have crossed the bridge from who I was to who I am um, and deeply grateful for all that has occurred and become sense. To those who listen to your story and reflect on their own experience and say, well, I'm just too old. I've lived too many years. It's not worth transitioning. It's not worth being honest. What is your advice to them? Oh, that's a, that's a thrilling question. Um, it's, it's never too late. It, it sounds cliche, but in my my own example, um, I accepted myself at age 50 and began my second puberty 40 years late <laughs> at, at age 40, uh, 53. Um, I, I really, I, I'm 61 now and I feel like I'm 21 in terms of my life uh, of being able to live as Lori Lee. Um, I feel like I'm just getting started and uh, I know trans individuals who came out and, and finally started living authentically in their late sixties, early seventies, and who have peace and joy in, in having done so. I have great envy and also uh, and, and joy for those who transition young and see how successful how successfully they do transition and that we live in a world now where although it's not ideal or perfect, they can hope for um, a safe place to live and to grow and to grow up and to be themselves and to have families and careers and all the things they should expect to have um, without being hampered by dealing with closeted gender dysphoria throughout their lives. Did you have to sacrifice your values and morals to live an authentic life? Hardly, um, not at all. Um, although I have moved beyond um, the institutional church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I have never felt a loss at all of my belief in my heavenly parents, belief in the divinity of, uh, of the teachings of the gospel. Um, and I live my life accordingly to the principles that I always have believed. Um, I didn't have any difficulty separating in my mind the fact that the truths and the values that I believed, some of which came to me through the vehicle of the church, weren't the church themselves. And so as the church put me out, which was an administrative action that God had nothing to do with, um, I was able to move on beyond somewhat freely being able to worship God according to the dictates of my own conscience. And my conscience also had confirmed to me my truth of who I really am. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to have build a relationship with God beyond the institutional church and some of its constraints. Um, and to live a fuller life spiritually as well. Um, 
I, I've not felt the desire or the need to, you know, to run out and, and enjoy the smorgasbord of sin, if you will, um, but to le- live a happy, um, loving, monogamous life <laughs> that, uh, you know, really is consistent with uh, the principles that I've always felt were right. I love it. I love your story. I love your candid ability to share that story. I don't love the pain. I don't love what it took to get here, but I've only known Lori Lee Hall. Right. And I love everything about you. Thank you. What haven't we talked about that you wanted to talk about in this episode? Just one thing that uh, that I touch on and that really has become a thematic part of the memoir that I'm writing, and I think I mentioned a little of this earlier, but just to drive the point home, as I tell my story, we live in a time now where in a polarized political environment and a polarized environment religiously in many ways, um, on the conservative side, groups, politicians uh, in our church have determined the importance from their agenda to beat the drum that gender is equal to biological sex, of sex assigned at birth. It's baked into the handbook at this point. It's been revealed in, uh, in general conference talks. Uh, it's a part of uh, a women's bill of rights that's being brought forward by conservative groups and being adopted by politicians in states like Texas and Utah and throughout the, the, the Deep South. And I'm writing my memoir in part to refute that pernicious fallacy that gender is not necessarily determined by a sex signed at, assigned at birth, but that gender identity is self-determined by the individual. And by telling my story in interviews such as this, by writing my story and having it published, I hope to combat, to thwart any continuing notion that gender itself is simply equal to biological sex assigned at birth. So much of the pernicious, destructive, harmful transgender, anti-transgender laws that are being legislated in so many red states that are particularly aimed at trans youth and their families um, are based upon that fallacy that there is only male and female, and it's determined by your genitals. Um, that's wrong on so many levels. It's, it's difficult to imagine how in a modern world with modern medicine and science that that could even be someone's paradigm. But I hope to add my story to that in such a way that it becomes impossible to ignore that a young person can experience gender conflict and that the way to mitigate and resolve that best in a person's life is to allow them to self-determine and then self-present and receive the medical and emotional care and family and community support necessary to live their true and authentic lives according to their self-determined gender identity. And so Thank you, Kyle, for letting me sit with you and offer these thoughts. I am, um, I have benefited from this episode, absolutely. And, and I thank you for being so vulnerable and open to the audience and, and to sharing your story. I, too, am looking forward to your memoir. I am excited to be able to read it, to be able to understand um, more intimately the timeline that we have discussed in this interview, but also the lessons learned. Um, sometimes we are victim of reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And I think a memoir uh, from your position 
allows us to no longer uh, reinvent the wheel, but to enjoy the path that has been prepared for us and able to travel that path free of boulders. Occasionally, we will step on a rock, a pebble or two, but that's part of the process. No longer do we have to move mountains in order for us to find happiness and joy and spiritual experiences on this side of the aisle. So thank you. Thank you, Kyle. It's been my pleasure. Now, your uh, memoir will be coming out. We're recording this in October of 2022. You're, are, you're planning on releasing the memoir um, in 2023. Yes. Um, Signature Books will be uh, responsible for the actual release date when the time comes, but um, my obligation is to get my manuscript into their hands as soon as it's ready. Uh, so that they can move it forward quickly, which is their desire as well. So we would hope at least by this time next year, if not sooner, to uh, to see it available. And uh, I'm excited for that opportunity to share in that way and to contribute to the community that way. Well, make sure you send me a copy just so I can make sure your editors did a great job at uh, <laughs> editing. Right, and I can add 99 cents of value to the book by putting my signature in it for you. <laughs> Even better. I'll take it. <laughs> Lori Lee Hall, thank you uh, again for sharing your story and for being on the Latter Gay Stories podcast. Thank you. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand this intersection. And I think we have been uh, well fed, to borrow a great Mormon term. This has been a fantastic episode to better understand uh, Lori Lee's story, to uh, provide each of us an opportunity to look inward and see that there is value intrinsically uh, to each of us and that living in our very best self, living according to the measure, the fullest measure of our creation is exactly as intended. And I thank you for uh, giving your time to uh, explore this intersection. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to not only draw nearer to the LGBTQ community, but also uh, develop better understanding. It's stories like mine, it's stories like Lori's, and it's stories like yours that help us each continue writing our own Latter-Gay story.